Grand Jai or don't 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 feel embarrassed to ask or anything. Okay, just just ask. All right. And um, for Thai students, he um, if you look, you know, um, during the um, talk, if you feel like you don't really understand. So you can raise your hands because uh, he can translate it for you. His Thai is excellent. OK, so uh, for people in the um, online, so uh, we will be speaking in English, you know, throughout the workshop. OK, so um, and this workshop is organized by um, Center of ASEAN Community Studies and uh, Faculty of Social Sciences, Norwegian University. So please um, join me. Give a big part to um, welcoming Dr. Thomas Lawson. Thank you very much for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, I, I think it, it's more like a future ambition to have a, a very many works, um, but I have done a few things on a various issues and today I'm very honored to have the opportunity to present some recent research on religion and politics, and in particular electoral politics to you, some of which is based on uh, very fresh data that we just sort of can give you, a, or I can give you a small glimpse of, um, but that needs to be further analyzed um, uh, for us to be able to arrive at any more, 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 more certain conclusions. Um, so I should also mention that some of the research here uh, is not mine alone. I am collaborating with other people. Ajahn Satithorn Tanani Tishot of KPI and also on the bank, recent Bangkok elections. Uh, the two of us are also collaborating with Joel Selway uh, from Brigham Young University. So uh, the credit doesn't go all to me for this, but it's a collaborative effort. Uh, and, and that's perhaps also an indication of one of the directions in which sort of political science is moving, that people have different skills and in order to produce research, you need to kind of create a little team to, 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 to pull projects together. So uh, why did I become interested in studying religion and electoral politics in particular? Well, that interest was triggered by some headlines that appeared in the run up to uh, the 2019 election, uh, uh, which was the first elections since the military coup uh, of 2014, right? And we can see here something that made me perplexed. Suddenly the headlines here, for those of you who don't speak Thai, they talk about Buddhist political parties. So, political parties for Buddhism. Uh, and I thought, well, Thailand is a majority Buddhist country. Aren't all political parties Buddhists or for Buddhism? So, we, you know, what, what's going on here? And, uh, <laughs> and, and that kind of triggered something for me. And, and there was a number of small political parties, new political parties established here, uh, ranging from the party established by Pai Bu Niti Tawan, uh, who was a rather controversial senator and who established a party which in its platform said that it would take the Buddha's teachings and make public policy based on that. And furthermore, in the platform said that one of the main things he wanted to achieve with this party was to reform Buddhism in Thailand. Patirup Satsana put Patirup Kanasong is the policy, na Penayobai. Um, and if you uh, recall, 
Ibon had actually, after the coup of 2014, been appointed by the junta to lead a committee, a kanakamakan, for reforming Buddhism. Patirup. Raputa satsana, risatsana. Or to Patirup, the state's management and control of religion. Um, one of the sort of subtexts of this was that Wat Patamakai was a danger to Thai Buddhism, much along the same lines that Taksin or Rabob Taksin was seen as a threat. So these two things were kind of same, same, but different. Uh, right. So they no, both needed to sort of be eradicated or cut down to size, eliminated from from political and religious influence. That in turn triggered a response from um, other uh, concerned Buddhists who thought that this was misguided. This lay person, right? He, he can't come in here and start, you know, <laughs> managing religion. That's something for the Mahathira Samakom and the, the, the Sangha Supreme Council and for the monkhood themselves to manage, right? And they, re, they, they made the choice of establishing their own political parties in a way to oppose some of these efforts that had been taken by the junta, right? So that um, kind of awakened a curiosity in me to know, well, what are different political parties actually saying about religion in their party platforms? So, and you know that, or you may not, but all Thai political parties, when they register as formal political parties, they have to submit um, a party platform, Udom Kanle Nayobai. Yeah, policy platform and ideology of the party and submit that to to the party registrar and this is then published in the royal gazette so if you're interested in political parties what they say they are for you can go to the royal gazette and find out what they have said that they are want to do um, and and i did that i didn't think that i would find anything really and the reason that I didn't think I would find anything is because that's what the uh, much of the literature on Thai politics has suggested to me, or what it tells us if we read uh, studies of Thai electoral politics in particular. So I want to take one small step back here, um, which by noting, first of all, that in much of the classic literature in comparative politics, um, religion is identified as one amongst many different political cleavages along which party systems um, are kind of uh, structured. So in Europe, you have something called Christian democratic parties, for example. And in, uh, in, in, in recent elections in many countries in, in around the world, you can see that religion and religious cleavages are becoming sharper and greater than they were in the past. So in the United States, for example, President Trump, he attracts something like 80% of the vote of white evangelical Christians. Uh, but less than 50% of Catholic voters, right? So you can see there are differences in where people go, depending on or linked to or correlating with their religious commitments and identities. And more recently, uh, scholars have highlighted what is sometimes labeled the rise of religious nationalism. Shat niom kang satsana, or something like that is becoming more and more important. And you can see this in the rise of Hindu nationalism in India and in Buddhist, militant Buddhist nationalism in Sri Lanka and in Burma, in Pama, right? So, so this is something that people have found in other parts of the world, that religion is becoming more and more. It's always been important, but now it's becoming more important, actually, it seems like. But if we look at 
the Thai literature or the literature on Thai politics. Yes. The what? Oh, okay. Should I pause then? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hang on. Hang on. Yeah. Hmm? Yes, of course. You 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 can get it. Well, where can you plug it in here? Yeah, there. Yeah, and Brian, right? It's the start of your set. Und habt an mir bin Kled Drive Rebau. Kevin, can you hear them clearly? Uh, I can hear, but I would just politely, respectfully request uh, a little increase in the volume level, as if the speaker was speaking to a larger audience, perhaps. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, very good. All right. So. I hope you can hear me clearly now, and perhaps the the slides are on the various systems as well. Yes, all good now. All good now. Brilliant. Thank you. I think so. So let's go. OK, where were we? OK, so in the literature on Thai politics and the literature on religion and politics, there's kind of a. Uh, a two different images being presented really when you read it, the literature. On the one hand, there's a literature on religion on the state, which emphasizes the centrality of Buddhism because it is essentially providing the legitimating framework for the Thai state. Uh, 
the Thai state being dependent on a cosmology of hierarchy, of moral hierarchy and things like that linked to karma uh, and with the king at the apex of this hierarchy, of course. Na chakrawan vitaya, layangiana, cosmology. But, so, so in that literature, Buddhism is like really, really important. Uh, but then when you go and read the literature on political parties and voting behavior, uh, religion is downplayed or ignored. It's not important. It's not really there. So to illustrate kind of this, this kind of tension, um, I want to ask you if you know what temple this is. I'm being slightly iro ironic, right? It's the uh, architect's impression of not a temple, but the Thai parliament. The Grata Sapa. Yeah. Sapaya Sapasatan is the name of this building. And the architects were inspired by uh, an ancient Buddhist treatise. Raipum. And in the middle there, you have Mount Meru. Prasumen, which is the center of cosmos. Sun Kang Kong Chakrawan. So you can see this architecturally represents a link between parliamentary politics and religious ideas. Um, but when you look at political parties and voting, it seems like actually most studies don't even consider religion. They look at all other kinds of things like education, wealth, income, regional um, identities and so on and so forth. And, and, and in the most recent studies or surveys of religion and parties and voting, um, you will often encounter that the words religion, Buddhism or Islam, for example, are not even mentioned. There are some exceptions to this, but they're mostly older. So, for example, Paul Chambers in his work on Thai factionalism, um, writing on the early 1990s mentions the temple faction of the Palang Tham, the Palang Dharma party, right? So there is some, but really very little. And in recent years, nothing, right? So it's kind of, it, it was a thing in the past maybe, but it never went anywhere and it went away. And the studies on the, that have been published on the 2019 election also don't really emphasize uh, or even mentioned religion, uh, but instead like patron-client relationships, factionalism, this is what's important more than anything else. Um, so I wouldn't really expect to find anything, right? Because that's what the, um, what the literature tells me. Uh, but I thought it might be worth a shot looking at this anyway. And, and um, the, um, there was a survey done that uh, Ajahn Satiton and I uh, then analyzed the data from after the election, asking about some religious questions. And the findings that I can sort of summarize for you very quickly here was that voters who are more religious, Kreng Satsana, uh, were more likely to support the pro-military parties than their rivals. And, and by the pro-military parties, I mean the parties that had declared that they wanted Prayut Chanosha, um, one of the coup leaders who had been prime minister after 2014, to continue in his role as prime minister, right? So that's, um, um, whereas, whereas, People who were less religious, my grand satsana, were more likely to support 
the parties that position the most clearly in opposition to to the sort of continuation of the legacy of the military coup in uh, politics after 2019. Um, we also looked at religious minorities, and we found that they were politically divided such that Muslims and Protestant Christians were more likely to support the pro-military or pro-prayut parties whereas Catholics um, were less likely to support the pro-military side of things uh, and were especially keen on voting for the Future Forward Party, Anakotmai. So uh, there are some interesting patterns here that emerge from the data. And one of the conclusions one can draw then is that the continued military influence in Thai politics, at least in part, to some degree, has a religious basis, right? So I want to take a step back and, um, and, and, and talk through how I kind of mapped the Thai party political system when looking at the different policies and positions of parties. What did they say about religion? Uh, which, you know, was then uh, a, a, a tricky question about sort of how do I even organize my thinking around this? And I found very helpful uh, as a conceptual framework, essentially, um, developed by two scholars, Soper and Fetzer. Uh, which draws on similar frameworks by others. And essentially they conceive of, or they position religion in relation to nationalism. So how is nationalism and religion related? And there's, and they imagine it more or less as a spectrum, a continuum. And at this end, the religious nationalism end, nationalism and religion is one and the same. So in order to be a member of this nation, you also must be a member of this religion, right? They go together. At the other end of the spectrum, there's a secular nationalism, which says that no, religion and nationalism have nothing to do with one another. So, um, and, and in the middle, we have something that Soper and Fetzer uh, call civil religious nationalism. And this is a sense of nationalism where, welcome, um, where the nation is imagined as one that is friendly and supportive of different religious traditions, not just one religious tradition, right? So religion is important to, 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 to the nation, um, but it's not everything, right? So it's more inclusive in a way. And it doesn't like extreme secular nationalism completely rejects religion, right? Um, uh, so this is kind of an accommodationist position in the middle there. Um, and if I think about this and, and, and explain it further, the implications of this is that the religious nationalism would advocate for a strong ideological link between the state and religion and of one particular religion, right? So in Thailand, they want the Thai state and Theravada Buddhism to be one and other religions, you know, no, 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 not interested in that, right? Uh, and they advocate for the creation of multiple like linkages, legal, bureaucratic, between the state and one religion, right? Uh, at the secular nationalist end, they want there to be weak or no institutional or ideological links between the state and religion, separate, yeah, 
And in the middle, we have this civil religious nationalism, which imagines the a kind of ideological support for religion. Religion is important and a source of morality and this kind of thing, right? Um, but doesn't really care which religion. Any religion will do more or less. Um, and in terms of institutional linkages, uh, maybe a kind of sort of friendly separation uh, or an or, or pluralistic accommodation, so that you can have support for maybe different religious schools, for example, right? And that's fine. You know, that's not a problem. Um, state financing for religious education, or religiously run education, for example, which is common in many countries, including in Europe, where I think the kind of prevailing understanding in Thailand is that religion and the state is separate. Well, actually, it's not uh, in many instances. Um, and if we look at Thai ideological sources that sort of align with this, um, I suggest that amongst the religious nationalists, uh, Prachao Thaksin, King Thaksin, is an important symbol as a kind of a Buddhist champion. Pibun Songkram is also uh, in, clear, clearly in this um, camp. Uh, with a very intolerant attitude towards Muslims and Catholics during his, his rule in the 1940s. The civil religious nationalism draws on ideological sources uh, from where King Ashoka, the Indian emperor, uh, the first Buddhist ruler, uh, Prajawa Sok, uh, is kind of an, depicted as an ideal model of kingship because he supported different religious traditions and communities, not just one. So it was an exemplar of religious toleration. Um, and if we think about Thai kind of nationalist writers and thinkers, uh, Prince Damrong, Damrong Rajanupab, and Prince Wan, Wan Waitayakon, um, and also Pridi Panomyong, I think fit into this. They're supportive of religion, they're keen to uh, create state religion links. And if we look at the secular nationalist, and it's more difficult to find ideological sources in Thailand, but I may, there may be some, it draws heavily on Western liberalism and to an extent on Marxism and socialism, uh, which, which um, seeks a, a, a firm separation of religion and the state. And towards that end of the spectrum, I suggest that we find future forward. They're not very clearly in that, um, in that position. So I call it like they have a stealthy, a secretive almost position in regards, in regards to this. So if I map the political landscape then along these lines, I would roughly try to position the different political parties roughly here. And what you find then is that most of the political parties are here in the center. There you have Palang Prasharat, uh, you have Pum Chai Thai, you have Prashatipat. And the ideology or the, the, the way that they conceive the link between religion and the state is something that I labeled in uh, in an article that is forthcoming on this, cosmopolitan royalism. So it centers essentially the king, the Thai king, as the supporter of different religions. And in the constitution, it says that the king is the uh, leading patron and protector of religion, plural. Satsanupathampo okay. doesn't mean it means more than that. It's wider, right? Um, and that's kind of the ideological model that's presented here. And religious minorities, the 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 um, the the phrase in Thai that um, is meant to capture this sort of royal grace and friendliness towards different religious communities is. Yutai praborom. Oh, what is it? Yes, that's the one. <laughs> that's the one, exactly. Yes, yes. 
So it means that they, the, the different religious communities are under sort of royal grace protection, something like that. Um, whether they are uh, Chinese Mahayana Buddhists, whether they are Muslims or Christians or whatever, right? Um, so that's kind of the ideological source of that. Pak Prasashat, this Southern Thai um, party that is quite successful in, 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 in the Southern Muslim dominated provinces, offers a slightly different twist on, on civil religious nationalism that draws its ideological sources from multiculturalism. What is that called? or something like that. I'm not sure what, what, what it would be. Yeah? And then Anakotmai is sort of towards that secular nationalist end. So how did I arrive at these conclusions? Uh, well, I did something very simple, simplistic even. I went and counted the frequency of words in the party platforms. So, nai udom kaanle, nai obai kong pak. So we can see that Pua Thai mentions religion 15 times, Buddhism two times, no Islam. Oh, and I have this word Tamatipatai, which was quite an important word for some political parties. And it Dharmacracy, so rule in accordance with Dharma, uh, something like that. So there's a kind of a religious resonance there. Uh, and then I also uh, counted the times that king, kasat, occurred in these party platforms. And I think we can see some kind of tendencies here. One rather curious thing that surprised me was that Palang Prasharat doesn't mention religion at all, which has an implication that they're actually not mentioned, sat sat Kasat. Hmm. But they do mention Kasat many times, right? <laughs> um, Future Forward mentions religion two times, doesn't mention Kasat. And when they mention religion, they only do so with reference to the equality uh, amongst people. So no discrimination based on gender, uh, ethnic identity, religion, and other factors amongst which people might be discriminated. So that's the only context in which they mention religion. Otherwise, they don't care about religion in their party platform. The Democrat Party mentions religion four times, and King 11, but doesn't mention Buddhism and doesn't mention Islam. This, new, this was a new party platform. And if we go back to an earlier party platform, they actually mentioned Islam a lot. So in coming into the 2019 election, for some reason, I don't know why, they stripped out all references to Islam. Gone. Um, I'd like to highlight Prashai Shahad. 41 mentions of religion. You can see religion is really what they're all about. Right? And they mentioned both Buddhism and Islam. Um, the Action Coalition of Thailand, this is uh, uh, Pak Ruam Palang, I think, yeah? The Pak Kong Su Ah, 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 Pak Su Thep. Tonan Pen Mom Tao, say my Pen Huana Pak, you know? Yeah. So they mentioned religion. And look, they mentioned Tamati Patai, democracy, two times. And lots of mentions of the king. And then we have Pandin time or the land of Dharma party, which is a tiny little party, um, which I identify as religious nationalist and one of the main kind of um, parties on that side of things. And they mention 11 times Buddhism, right? So you can see they're really heavily into, into promoting Buddhism, but not so keen on mentioning Islam or any other religions. Yeah. So. I also looked at and counted the presence or absence of different policy elements. So, Minayobai, Minayobai, Alaiban. Nai Pua Thai, 
the first thing I looked at was whether or not they declare support for uh, the principle of Shahat Satsana Pramahakasat. And most parties in their platform declare support for that, but not all. Uh, I also look for a general statement of support for religion. Sanap Sanun, hai Satsana. Um, support for religion to be like informing people's lives, something like that, and guiding them in their in their daily life. And then there are, I, I'll check for whether or not they have a policy on state patronage, upatam, nah? or, or, or providing budgets and things like that for religion. Uh, I look at sort of religious equality, you know, equal treatment, irrespective of religious identity. So that's more like religious freedom and things like that, right? And then I look at whether or not the party in its platform mentions something about support for the idea that Buddhism or Theravada Buddhism is really the most important religion because most Thais are Buddhists and so on and so forth, right? So it, it has the status of a majority religion. It should get sort of special treatment in a way. And, and in the paper, I actually look at a number of other things as well, but this kind of summarizes it because I think it can highlight some interesting patterns. One of which is that Pyatai is quite you know, proficient in addressing and hitting all of these points, whereas many other parties is more like hit and miss, you know, some of it, but not, not a lot. Um, as I mentioned, Palang Prasharat doesn't mention religion. You can see their policy platform, their Udom Khan, nothing on religion, which signals to me that they're essentially happy with the status quo and that this is a matter for, you know, the king <laughs> to possibly have, you know, views on how religion should be managed and the bureaucracy, this existing state mechanisms and structures should just be running as they do. There's not a big issue here. Um, so they are moving away from the policy that they had during the, um, in the immediate aftermath of the coup, which was to promote reform of Buddhism, Ganpati Rup Satsana, which alienated some, right, and led to the rise of Buddhist political parties. So they've stripped all of that out if they ever thought of including it, right? is not there. So they, they've cleaned the party platform of any kind of, of anything that could cause religious controversy. I think they are basically afraid of religious tensions and controversy, so avoid it. Don't talk about it. Just talk about, um, about um, the, um, uh, the system of government. Rabab, Prashati, Patai. And me, Mahakasat Ben Pramuk, right? The democratic government with the state, with the king as head of state, which is the sort of ideological slogan which summarizes everything that they are for. Um, I want to highlight again Pandin uh, Tam, which is for state patronage of religion and an emphasis on Buddhism as a majority. And you can see that the only other party that has both of those two things is Puatai. So in a way, right, Puatai is positioning itself to signal to these potential voters who might be attracted here that, well, actually, you know, we, we are offering that alternative, or that's how I in, I'm interpreting it. Okay, so the next question then is whether or not Okay, so we I found that well, actually, parties talk about politics or religion in different ways, and it, there's then the possibility that voters might pick up on this, and that vote choice, which party you choose to vote for, might at least in part be correlated with the ways in which well, your religious identities, your various religious commitments, and so on. So, uh, the KPI did a survey after the election, which included three questions on religion. The first was about religious identity. Atalaktang satsana. 
And the question is, what is your religion, right? And the second question goes to religious belief, or at least in some sense, sense religious belief. Or really, uh, how, so how strict or how pious are you? Something like that. Can me kwam kreng satsana mak piang dai. A lot or a little, right? So people can pick there. And then behavior, pritikam tang satsana. How often do you attend religious ceremonies? And the question is, tan kau ruam pritikam satsana boy kenai. Right? So we have three different questions actually reflecting then three different aspects of religion or religiosity, identity, belief, and behavior, practice. So what the first step we took then in this analysis was to look at the supporters for different political parties and sort of see what was the profile, the religious profile of their supporters. So we looked at all the Puatai here in this column, voters, all the respondents say, yeah, I voted for Puatai. And then we say, well, were they Buddhist? Were they Muslim? Were they Protestants? Were they Catholics or were they something else? And you can see that 98.8 .8 of the people who responded that they voted for Puatai were Buddhists, declared themselves to be Buddhists. And what really stands out for me here is the uneven distribution of Muslim mi minorities. So some parties have a support base that is sort of more religiously pluralistic than other parties. And the parties that stand out there are Pum Jai Thai. 20% of the people who said that they voted Pum Jai Thai were Muslims. Um, and the other party that stands out in that respect is Palang Prasharat, where almost 11% of their voters um, were Buddhists, sorry, Muslims. Also standing out here, as I already mentioned, is the difference between Protestants and Catholics, where the Protestants disproportionately support Palang Prasharat, and the Catholics disproportionately support Future Forward, and I quote mine. Right, 5.4% of the future forward voting base is Catholic, compared to only 1.1% in the total sample. So it's a huge overrepresentation there, it looks like, right? Um, and on religious belief, we divided it into people who said that they were sort of moderately. Mm. And, and here again, we see some, some tendencies for Halang Prasharat to have quite a lot of the um, very religious. But Puatai isn't far behind, actually, there. Future Forward doesn't have many people voting for them who say that they are Kring Satsana Magmak. And if we look at uh, religious behavior, pritikam, kao ruam piti tang satsana, boy can I? We can see uh, again this pattern that palang prasharat gets the vote of the people who are more frequent participants in religious ceremonies, um, and that the others have, have less than they do under the average for both puatai. Uh, but actually, surprisingly, future forward, quite a lot, right, above average. So it's strange that people who say that they are my kreng satsana, kao ruam piti tang satsana, boy. I don't understand what's going on there quite. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to ease the presentation, one of the things that div the devil's analysis of Thai elections is that there are so many parties and it's difficult to make sense of it all. So in this part, one move we made was to sort of lump parties together in two different camps, reflecting essentially what we think is sort of the political polarization in Thai politics in the 2019 elections. So there was a clear kind of pro-military block of parties 
led by Palang Prasharat and supported by Pak Ruam Palang of the Action Coalition for Thailand, Suteps Party, and the People Reform Party, Pak Prasashon Patirup, uh, Pai Bu Nititawan's party. Both of these parties, by the way, in their party platforms make reference to Tamati Patai. Right. Uh, and the other only other party that does that was the Pak Palang Tamai, the new Palang Dharma party. So I may it might be the sort of the resurrection or reincarnation of the temple faction uh, of the old uh, old Palang Tam party. And then on the pro-democracy side or sort of the anti-military side, we have Pua Thai, Future Forward, uh, Seri Ruam Thai, Prashashat. Pak Setakit Mai and Pak Puyashat. And, and, and as you can see, this block actually received many more votes and won many more seats than these political parties did, and this side did. So the reason that Palang Prasharat actually got to form the coalition uh, and continue to govern or to, 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 to govern is because they pulled in parties that were more ambiguously positioned, like the Democrat Party and and and, and Pum Chai Thai and so on. It wasn't clear quite where they were going at this time. So they are not included in either side here. So we kind of ignore those parties. Um, and and <laughs> Satit Thorn makes some fabulous statistical analysis. I am not very skilled at statistics, so I, I'll be very brief <laughs> about that uh, and try to sort of skip over it to the extent that I can. Um, but uh, we do then a couple of different sort of statistical tests and we use some control variables because religion isn't the only thing that matters probably. Maybe where people live matters in wealthy cities, in poor rural areas the level of education, how old they are, their region, with many people having noticed that there's a kind of a north and northeast um, tendency to vote for one side. Um, and then we also ask about lang language, whether or not people speak Thai at home. Um, and uh, the, some of the findings here then, when we include these um, uh, these controls, we find that, yes, there's quite some significance, statistically at least, in the correlations here. So if we look at the pro prayut side of politics only, the sign for Buddhist is negative, right? So if you're Buddhist, you're less likely to vote for, for, for Prayut and those parties. If you're Muslim, the sign is positive, right? You're more likely to vote for that side. If you're Catholic, again, negative, less likely, Protestant, more likely. Uh, religious belief, Kreng Satsana, positive. Religious behavior, Pritikam Tang Satsana, positive, but not statistically significant. So it kind of washes out. Um, and, um, and we do similar things for the pro-democracy side vote as the dependent variable. And you can see that there's some slight difference here in the uh, statistical significance. Suddenly religious behavior is negative and somewhat statistically significant. So religious behavior and religious belief is a bit more ambiguous than identity. We also do bivariate cross tabulations. So here we have um, we, we take all the voters for pro prayut parties and for their opponents and pool them and then look at, well, where do the Buddhists go? How many of the Buddhists go here? There you can see 73% of all the Buddhists in this sort of sub-sample voted for that side and only 26% for the pro prayut bloc. But 78% of the Muslims voted for pro uh, and 66% of the Protestants. And Catholics, 84% voted for the pro-democracy side of things and mainly um, future forward then. Religious behavior and religious belief, what I want to you to pay attention to here is kind of how, how the numbers change as you go down. So here you have people who, who never 
go to religious ceremonies and people who go to religious ceremonies very frequently. And similarly here, religious belief, people who say that they don't have religion and down here, people who say they are very religious. And look at the change in the numbers. Here it goes from small to larger. So the more, more, more Kayan, the, the more industrious you are in joining religious ceremonies, the more likely you become to vote for Prayut. And here the numbers go the other direction, right? They become smaller and smaller. So the more uh, religious in that sense you are, the less likely you, you become more, less likely to vote for that side of things. And similarly here, right? For religious belief amongst the non-religious, like 100% in that column, zero here, um, very religious. You can see the numbers go up, there they go down. So that's the significance of that. Now, moving on then, right? So this was kind of exciting for us. Wow, we found this effect. No one has ever found this kind of effect before in studies of Thai electoral politics. So we were really excited about the election to Bangkok governor. Na? Um, what, two months, three months ago now? Yeah, so we wanted to do a survey on that. And we also wanted to, we weren't really satisfied with the questions that the first survey had asked. The questions aren't good because they're not tailored to the Thai polit religious context. And we wanted to tailor them to the Thai religious context bet. Those questions are part the, of the first survey. They're part of kind of an, an, an international survey program that surveys elections in every country in the world, like every time there's an election. So they have very generic and general questions that are supposed to be able to be asked anywhere in the world. And we want to know more about Thai, um, the, the Thai situation. Um, so here, I, these are the vote result, the outcomes. Chachat Sitipan got the majority and he is now the Bangkok governor and a popular one, it seems like. He's creating quite a lot of excitement and enthusiasm. But there were a lot of other candidates as well. And one of the challenges is to kind of see whether, you know, our findings were related to sort of national politics. And here on the government, Bangkok governor doesn't have very much to do with religious policies or anything like that. And it's also not entirely clear what party they belong to at the national level. It doesn't necessarily match on to national level politics, right? But in this election, I think one can make the claim that there was quite a strong link. And I've used colors to kind of help you see the, uh, the um, alignment. So Chachat here, he's a former minister uh, um, who is closely aligned with Thai, So he gets the red color. We wrote Lakana Adison is orange, right? Um, and and he, because of his uh, association to Anakotmai and its reincarnation. So uh, we Democrat. Um, Sakonti Patiakun is Pakpalang Pasharat. Uh, Asawin Kwan Muang is also Pakpalang Pasharat. Asawin was the incumbent governor appointed by the junta, and Sakonti was his deputy. Wrong Puwa, mm, And Puwa. And then uh, finally, Rotsana To Sit Rakun um, was also in that general camp, you could say. Sakonti was a PDRC uh, activist leader. So again, associated with Sutep, right? And, and that mobilization against Yingluck's government. Rosana is more linked to an earlier mobilization, the Pantamit, the PAD. So there's some shades of difference between them. But generally speaking, they have all been rather supportive of, in some sense, the military continuation of politics and fearful of sort of the what they see as the corruption and so on of the Thaksin side of politics. Right. So so in that sense, 
she or, or for that reason, she also gets a rather dark blue shade there. OK, religion in this election then. So. Hancock governors don't have religious policies per se, but in their campaigning, they often, um, you know, on their Facebook feeds and so on and so forth, make a show of religious piety. They like to show that they are kring satsana, they are good people in that sense, good people. Um, and they also signal to various extent links to different communities, shum shon tang tang. By why kong, ko pon ti ti san tong ni, they go and um, and, and make offerings at various religious sites in order to essentially establish a link with the local community that prays at, at that site. So they go to various re religious establishments. Also interesting to me here is that some candidates are quite keen to put religious minorities on their Facebook fleet. So we can see both Asawin and Sakonti representing Palang Prasharat, giving prominent display to their embrace of Bangkok's Muslims, right? And other candidates not so keen on signaling this uh, on, on, in their sort of public communications, uh, but perhaps keen to demonstrate that they are very pious, strong, pious Buddhists, uh, that they are meditating, like Rosana over here, Rosana, yeah. Um, so there's a religious element to their campaigns. Now, if we look at the sort of similar things that we looked at before, their religious identities and how they how they um, align here. Remember that Puatai in the national election was not good at gaining Muslim votes. Well, Chat Chat is pretty good, right? In in our sample and this survey of close to 800 people, around nine percent were Muslims, and 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 in in Chat Chat's support base, he gets eight um, percent Muslim. Uh, so the findings from the national election doesn't really map onto here. Um, we do, however, find that um, the, some of the other things do kind of map on. You can see Sakonti is close to 20 percent of his voters were, were Muslim. So clearly very, very strong links somehow to Muslim communities in Bangkok. Asa win not bad with 7% either. So if you think of these as sort of Palang Prasharat together, they get quite a big share of the Muslim vote. Rosana on the same side of things get none, right? And if we look at uh, Catholics and uh, Protestants and Catholics, you can see again that they're quite uh, clustered around the Palang Prasharat and for Catholics, the uh, Sushachawi, uh, who is linked to the Democrat Party. Um, so that's that's sort of what stands out there. If we then look at religious beliefs, um, we, as I mentioned, wanted to tailor the questions to the Thai religious contexts. So we asked people about reincarnation, karma, and sacred things. So the first question is, to what extent do you believe in reincarnation? And the second question is, to what extent do you believe that the law of karma determines events in your life? And the third question is, to what extent do you believe that various sacred things can help fulfill your hopes? So these two things, the first two questions, really goes to sort of orthodox Theravada Buddhist uh, 
doctrine about reincarnation and karma. The question about sacred things, sing succeed, is really more ambiguous because there are lots of different things that can be succeed. And sing succeed, which has the power uh, to grant you perhaps certain things that you desire, come in many different ways, shapes, and forms. So amongst sing succeed are all, you know, past kings, for example. You know, you can go to Naresuan here on campus. He's a sing succeed. You go and why call upon? You can do that, right? So that's more kind of an, an aspect of Thai religiosity that is really quite important uh, for understanding Thai religiosity, but we will miss if we take a sort of an orthodox Theravada Buddhist approach to it, because that is something that many sort of strict um, Buddhist monks would say is superstition, magic, and we don't deal with that. S some monks say that. There are many other monks who don't reject it in that sense, right? But the, the Thai kind of um, um, word that challenges these kinds of practice is to call it ngom ngai. Yeah. So <clears throat> what did we find then? Um, well, I think the interesting thing to look at here is that in belief in reincarnation is quite high over on this side uh, of the of the table, which has the conservative uh, candidates, the Palang Prasharat linked um, voters. They are w above the, um, the, the average for the sample, whereas on this side of things, sort of linked to the more pro-democracy side of things, they're below. So there's, um, there's less, you can see Puyatai there and future forward. The starkest contrast is between the followers of We Wrote Lakana Adison, you know, almost no one has a strong, this, this percentage I should explain is for people who say that Shia Yang Mark. So 9.5% of Wirot's backers say that they Shia Yang Mark in reincarnation, whereas 62% of Rotsana's followers say that they have a very strong belief. Karma, similarly, you can see the starkest contrast between Wirot's followers. 13% almost, you know, 81 for Rotsana. So they really believe in karma and some people don't believe it so much. But again, if you look here at the sort of the, the average amongst these three candidates is clearly higher than for, for, for Shachat. Amongst sacred things, um, again, uh, Asawin and Rotsana are getting a fairly high share of that and we wrote Lakana Addison's followers uh, are more disposed to believe very much in the power of sacred things to grant you boons, uh, more believe in seeing succeed than believe in reincarnation. Right? So, so there's something interesting going on there. I think it is referred to in the Thai popular culture today as Mu Te Lu. This is the Sai Mu perhaps. Um, that's showing there. Okay, frequent religious practices. Here again, we wanted to tailor the questions to the Thai context. So we ask about offering alms to monks. How often do you do that? Um, and the question is, so, so this is a question of and we ask them about observing the five precepts at the temple. Uh, chanting, uh, meditating, and here we didn't want to use the conventional word for meditation, which is samadhi, because that's today also linked with like secular practices like mindfulness and things like that and doesn't have a religious connotation necessarily. So instead we chose a, a phrase or a word which we think better reflect sort of the serious religious um, commitment to meditation, which is tan patibat kamatan boy can I? Uh, so patibat kamatan is the way that uh, Theravada uh, Buddhist institutions often refer to their uh, meditation 
practices and on co on college campuses, university campuses here, you may have student societies that are committed to to serious Buddhist meditation, and they will often have names like Shomron, Shomron Gamatan, or something like that. Yeah. And then, how often do you worship sacred things? Tan Busha, why? Sing Saksit, Tang Tang, Boy, can I? So those those were the questions. And again, we see that there is a tendency for um, the Palang Prasharat side of things to be quite strong there, particularly for Asawin's followers. Um, the, uh, the Wirot followers, they are not very committed to offering alms to monks. Observing the five precepts, not many people uh, in Puyatai do that regularly, but Sakonti's followers are very enthusiastic um, visitors of temple to observe the, the five precepts. And as a win too, curiously, zero for both Rosana and we wrote. So these differences in religious practices on this conservative side, I think reflects different religious commitments. I suspect that Rosana's followers might be like committed to Sai Putatat, the Putatat uh, kind of lineages or the Santi Asok lineages or something like that. So they are also alienated or in distance from establishment Thai Buddhism in some sense, similar perhaps to the Wirot followers, right? Meditation, zero for Wirot, and the highest for Rotanas followers. So there's serious meditators, but they don't go to the temple to Tu Sinha. Maybe they Tu Sinha at home, right? And you can do that too. Um, so that question is really about public religiosity, and these are about private rel religiosity. These are things you can do at home. Uh, worshipping sacred things, there's small differences between sort of the two sides of politics here. Um, it's the most common thing for Shachat's followers to do. Um, and we can see that we wrote followers again, they're very low on many things, but here they're quite high, almost near the sort of the sample average. And Rosana, very, very little, right? So this might be reflecting that many of them think that this is Ngom Ngai or something like that. That's a hypothesis, at least. Yeah. We also wanted to get at this question about the linkage between nationalism and religion. So we included a question that asked people um, how, what they thought were the important things for you to be a Thai. So the question is, some people say that the following things are important for being truly Thai. Others say they are not important. How important do you think each of the following is? ได้กล่าวว่าสิ่งต่างๆเหล่านี้มีความสำคัญกับการเป็นคนไทยแท้ในขณะที่บางคนบอกว่าไม่สำคัญ <laughs> ดังนั้นท่านคิดว่าสิ่งต่างๆที่จะกล่าวต่อไปนี้มีความสําคัญมากสําคัญกับการเป็นคนไทยแท้แค่ไหนทรูไทยไทยแท้ does a true thai have to be do have right and the four four different things one could make a longer list we choose to do a shorter version is to say maybe you have to be born in thailand good name and thai Maybe you have to speak Thai. Put Pasa Thai Dai. Maybe you have to be a Buddhist. Ben Chao Put. So this is the one like we've sneakily put in there to capture the, the religious nationalism aspect, right? And then we ask the question of um, that maybe it's important to honor the monarchy. And as you can see, the answer is very important. Right? People who say that it's very important to, you know, be born in Thailand, speak Thai, etc. The, the interesting thing is that Ben Chao Put gets the fewest share of respondents. So Bangkok voters 
clearly don't think that it's a priority that you're Buddhist in order to be Kuntaite, right? So if you look at the other side here, people who say that it's not important at all is twice as many as the people who say that it's very important. And so that tells us something about that. The way that Thai nationalism has been constructed and perceived, at least in Bangkok, doesn't tie Thai, <laughs> T-I-E, a Thai national identity to Buddhism. Um, one, one interesting thing, so the monarchy is getting the second highest share here for very important. Speaking Thai is most important. You can see here, people who say they can't choose, look, my Dai, 5% can't choose how important the monarchy is much higher than for any of the other questions, which might also indicate something about the sensitivities of that particular question. Okay, so we found some patterns uh, in, 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 or I should say that I have found some patterns looking very quickly at the data from the Bangkok gubernatorial election. My colleagues, Satitan and Joel, they will do sort of a fully fledged kind of statistical analysis with all the bells and whistles and controls and all that. And maybe these conclusions or those these tentative observations will collapse under the weight of that statistical scrutiny, but perhaps not. We, that has to be seen, you know, we, we'll see that in, in future. The, um, the conclusion so far is that this is preliminary for the Bangkok election. But if we look, um, Take a look at this. The, the questions that arise for me is whether or not, one is a historical one, was 2019 kind of unique? Was there something that happened then that made religious factors more salient? Um, or was it always there? So what we hope to do is to look at historical surveys and analyze them. Um, and then we've already taken a stab at kind of adapting survey questions to better fit with high religious beliefs and practices. Um, but we want to extend that. We want to make a longer survey, ask perhaps other, well, other and or um, adjust the questions we have asked. So if you have any ideas for like, well, this would be a brilliant question to ask Thai voters in order to capture something important about what they believe uh, in religious terms or practices or, or something like that. I'm very keen to hear your suggestions. And we hope to build on this survey um, that was done in the Bangkok election for the next general elections and see if we can ask some questions then and see if you know, we can find something interesting about religion and electoral politics. It might be that 2019 was like a fluke random event where we can find some patterns and then they go away. We don't know. Um, and what's next in terms of electoral politics, political competition and contestation? One of the questions that I have is whether or not the fading of Prayut and the seeming unraveling of pra Palang Prasharat makes these more religious, more pious voters and some of these religious minorities uh, alienated from the pro-military side of things. Maybe they have lost faith in this um, sort of political solution and will orientate themselves in other ways. Um, and then with regards to political parties, I want to keep an eye on how political parties position themselves in religious terms and particularly focus on Hua Thai and its various offshoots. And the question for me really is whether or not they will continue to travel in the direction of religious nationalism or emphasizing Buddhism and Theravada Buddhism in their policies and in, perhaps in their uh, discourse as well. And there's some suggestions that they are at least they're trying to appeal to the sort of religious nationalist um, voter in Thailand. 
And one of the indications of this is the rather prominent role of one particular uh, Pua Thai MP from Sakonakon in Isan, in the northeast of Thailand. His name is Niyom Wecha Kama, Kama, sorry. Uh, and he has a PhD in Buddhist studies. Uh, so he's commonly referred to as Dr. Maha Niyom, right? And he has in Parliament over the past uh, few years, constantly championed Buddhist causes and institutional Buddhist causes. And most recently, he and some of his colleagues put forward four draft lo proposed laws that would strengthen the Thai state's ideological and institutional links with Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism. Um, and those are the laws there. And this is another uh, former deputy leader of Pua Thai who has formed a new political party, the New Equality Party, um, who has been traveling the Northeast to shore up support amongst various Buddhist nationalist networks who are concerned about the protection of Buddhism against all forms of threats. When you talk to people like this, and I've interviewed some of them, what they really are concerned about is Islam, right? There's an, an anti-Islamic uh, current in, 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 in parts of Thai society that this sort of um, concern about the protection of Buddhism is, is mining. If you want to read more about this, you can find this um, online, the articles that have been published on these themes. More will be forthcoming on the Bangkok election eventually, I hope. And I want to stop there and thank you very much for your patience. And I'm very keen to hear your questions or comments and so on and so forth. So, yes. How about um, we give it the, to the priority to the online first? Um, the online people. Hello. Hi. Hello, Sadiha. Hi, Anna. Do you have questions or yes. comments or? Yes, yes please. Thank you. Yes. Um, and thank can you, you for please, your... um, Can you please um, briefly introduce yourself? Thank sure, you. sure. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and thank you so much for this uh, wonderful, interesting presentation. Um, my name is Anna. I'm with the Center of uh, ASEAN Community Studies. Um, Faculty of Social Science, Narayswan University. Um, I actually really enjoyed the presentation and um, curious about the 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 in in the way that this research done to study when one of your slide mentioned about the religious nationalism and civil religious nationalism and so forth. So this actually also uh, remind me with one of uh, a research done in uh, Indonesian context to, uh, to study about the, uh, the relationship between Islam and democracy in Indonesia. Um, as I, I can uh, kind of like refer that in Thailand context that uh, this um, kingdom is majority Buddhist, yet in Indonesia is uh, majority Islam or Muslim. Uh, however, both country are not officially, you know, refer the as, as a religious um, country. Like, for example, Indonesia is Republic. We're not Muslim country or we're not Islamic country. As so that uh, in, in Thailand they, 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 with this uh, monarch uh, constitutional, it's not like Buddhists, you know, but indeed the majority of um, the people are uh, you know, like Buddhism. And as we learn through throughout your presentation also that 
here, when it comes to uh, electoral behavior or electoral preference, we cannot get rid of the religion uh, and associate it with their preference when it comes to uh, elect or vote um, the, the candidate uh, in the, in the uh, election. So my question is actually how the electoral behavior or preference of the majority Buddhists is actually shaped the, the the nationalism the way they picture nationalism like Thai nationalism because uh, one of the result in another slide you showed that actually what what is it more uh, import most important element to become Thai right I mean r being a Buddhist is not in the highest one right so I, I'm I'm wondering how actually like uh, throughout your finding that this um, particular um, understanding, especially in, in, in the level of people, the society, between their electoral preference, whether to vote um, party that um, kind of like promote a Buddhism idea uh, and toward the way they perceive or to picture uh, their understanding of Thai nationalism. Thank you. Should we take another question? Kevin? Thank you. Was it Anna? Thank you very much for your question. Yes, it's Anna. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. Should I try to answer Anna's question while we see if that, there that are will be other, great. <laughs> the other, other questions coming up here? So, right. I mean, one of the things that I'm, your, your comparison to Indonesia is very apt. And what I call cosmopolitan royalism as a kind of a <laughs> dominant hegemonic idea about the relationship between religion and the nation and the state has a uh, corresponding kind of similar civil nationalist or civil religious nationalism in Indonesia and there the slogan you could say is Pancasila. Right. And yeah. So that's kind of the ideological um, mm. support for different religions. Mm. <clears throat> but but in both Thailand and in Indonesia, it's important that it's not sort of an unconditional recognition mm. of religious pluralism, but there are certain sort of officially recognized religions, right? And, yes. and, and they have to actually conform to certain standards and so on and so forth in order to be, um, be um, recognized by the state. Mm. Um, mm. Um, so, so, so there are, it's, it's not a free for all by any means, right? There, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a structure to it and limitations to religious toleration in both Thailand and in, in, in Indonesia. Right. Um, but nevertheless, it's clearly not religious nationalism where there's mm -hmm. a very strong fusion of national identity and a particular religion or sect mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, something like that. If we're thinking about the historical sources of this, so when when I speak of sort of three different models of nationalism, I'm I'm I'm, I'm emphasizing that. The mute that I I in this research um, I, I don't I'm look sorry. at this. Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, Kevin is muted now. Thank you, Kevin, because it was a coin. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, Kevin. so one of your questions was like about the historical sources, what has shaped uh, this mm -hmm. conception of, of, of the nation. And I've, I've tried to address a bit of that in another paper, actually, um, uh, that's published in, uh, in a journal. You can find it on my, you know, if you go to Google Scholar, you can find it there uh, or link to it. Um, and what I emphasize there is the uh, early in the early 1900s, how essentially state building elites, royals, princes, etc., in trying to create the modern nation states, um, emphasized the role of the king uh, in a kind of a 
an imperial position. So in old empires, right, one of the things that they are very proud of is that they integrate different peoples of different religions and they rule over them all, irrespective of that, right? And, and that's kind of continued. And the ideological source for it, in part at least, is this uh, ideal of Buddhist kingship centered on, on, uh, on the image and perhaps the myth of uh, King Ashoka. And that was mobilized very effectively, I think, uh, in creating a kind of an ideological solution for the problem that, or the challenge that all societies or most societies have to face, which is religious pluralism, a reality of religious pluralism. And that was already included in the first uh, constitution, the first permanent constitution in 1932. And we can read there some of the reasoning behind why it is that the king is positioned as the patron and protection of religions in the plural rather than only Buddhism to the exclusion of others. Was there another online question? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Kevin Nowen. I'm with Panya Sastra University of Cambodia. Um, I think my question kind of connects to what you said, uh, and maybe I just would ask you to clarify a bit, because it seems to me that there is a tension to cosmopolitan royalism, which lends itself to conservatism, whereas uh, cosmopolitanism is generally linked to liberalism. Um, and you can see that, I think, in your uh, spectrum of political parties, where there's nothing over on the hard liberal side but things tend toward the other side. Um, so I'm wondering if you think there's attention to that, even though you said historically this has been something that kings tried to emulate uh, going back to Ashoka. I think there are some Khmer kings uh, related to the Khmer Empire who might be uh, more kind of recent examples of that. Um, but certainly the the royalty gets its justification from Buddhism. So I would think that there would be some tension to that, even though there might be some effort to be tolerant and inclusive. Um, my second question has to do with rec reconciling two statements. Uh, the first is the statement that there is a religious basis to military involvement, but at the same time, there is no religious basis to nationalism. How can those two things be, you know, compatible. Uh, and my third question has to do with the sampling and the surveys which you discussed, because you mentioned sample size and then cross tabulations and so on. I'm just confused about whether that applies, which sir, if that applies to the survey you did related to the uh, gubernatorial elections in Bangkok, or if that is related to the uh, national level survey. And if it's not related to the survey, for Bangkok, could you tell us a little bit about the sampling and so on? Um, so let me take the statistics um, bit first, because you're really asking the wrong person <laughs> in the sense that uh, uh, it's uh, Satiton who is the champion and expert on, on sampling uh, strategies and so on. Um, but the, all the statistical analysis, the more advanced statistical analysis, refers to the 2019 election. We haven't done any statistical analysis of the uh, Bangkok gubernatorial elections yet, uh, because we only got the final data with the cleaned up version and all that on Monday. So it's very fresh. So I've just sort of taken a, an initial look at some of the patterns that one can detect or, or to see if one can detect any patterns and clusterings and so on and so forth. And all that analysis um, remains to be, um, be seen. In, in the terms of the, of the first questions, I think I sort of agree with, uh, with you that there is a tension. And the tension is that the king has to be Buddhist. You cannot have a Muslim king in Thailand, of course, right? So, so Buddhist kingship is 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 primary, and, it, and that is sort of the 
that, that, that's sort of, you know, difficult to escape in this uh, formulation of what I call cosmopolitan royalism. And I would not necessarily link cosmopolitanism to, to liberalism. I think cosmopolitan sort of practices are related to, at least in part, to empire and empire building uh, are often very cosmopolitan and favoring the mingling and mixing of races and religions in the pursuit of commerce and so on and so forth. So um, liberalism has taken up some of those ideas and, and built on them in, in, in other ways. So I think that, uh, so I think that there, there is a religious basis to civil religious nationalism in Thailand. There is a commitment to religion grounded in an ideal of Buddhist kingship. Right? So that's how we square that circle in a way. It is not necessary though for, or few people think that it's necessary for someone to be Thai to be Buddhist or to, to be Buddhist in order to be Thai. Right? But, so I think that's, that resolves some of that, that tension. Was there something I forgot to answer? Oh, thank you. Hello, that, that, that was great. Thank you very much for your response. Uh, so, so I, uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Katsuyuki Takahashi. I'm uh, Japanese and I'm a fundamentalist of Buddhism. <laughs> I belong to a religious group and a member of the political party in Japan. And uh, now in Japan, the religious is a very big issue because the former prime minister Shinzo Abe was assassinated because of he, the uh, LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party, was supported by the religious group. Is a uh, what's the name of the Reunification Society? Huh? Sorry, Unification Church. Yeah, it's a Korean religious group. Yeah. Anyway, I have several comments, but uh, I think many people want to give comments or question to you. So I will give uh, one comment for you. So about the result of survey of the future for the party, why they less believe in Buddhism, but they often go to join the ceremony. It's uh, easy for me, but it's a case of Japan. I'm referring to the case of Japan. When uh, Japanese are asked which religion you belong to, most of Japanese answered, no religion. But it's not correct because Japanese believe everything in practice. I think it is the case of Thailand. According to the late Japanese scholar, Yoneo Ishii, who was a, a professor of Kyoto University, he is a specialist on Thai Buddhism. He divides into two categories of Buddhism. First is a uh, dogmatism of Buddhism, dogmatism, belief in the teaching, teaching. Second is a practice, practice in Buddhism. So in case Japanese believe, not believe, practice Buddhism, practice not only Buddhism, but also every religious religion, we go to church, we go to shrine, we go to temple and uh, donate something. Or uh, we celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas, like Thai people. So I think you, I, I, you do already, I think, but uh, we have to consider of the generation. The future forward party is supported by many Younger people, younger people like you, like to eat cake 
a Merry Christmas. So young people go to festival at temples with girlfriends or boyfriends or friends, but they don't think of dogma or reincarnation or karma, but they practice. It's a case of Japan and Thailand, I think. So if you put the data, cross-check with the generation, I think uh, you have uh, another idea. Thank you very much. No, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the future forward party supporters are Japanese. <laughs> Uh, but one of the one of the questions that this or one hypothesis that I'd be keen in seeing if one can sort of tease out is whether or not there's kind of a reverse causality here. <clears throat> that is to say that religious positions and ideas shape religious practices and beliefs rather than the other way around, right? The common assumption is that religious practices and beliefs shape political attitudes, voting behaviors, and so on and so forth. But it might actually be that there's a reverse causality. And the reason for this might be, this is just an hy a hypothesis, but there's sort of, we've seen this in other places, including the United States, which is that, um, when religion is mobilized for political purposes, as in the election of Donald Trump, right? Other people who otherwise would have regarded themselves as religious and joining in those churches and so on and so forth, suddenly feel slightly alienated from that. And they back off from their previous religious commitments and practices. So it might be that the polarization in Thai politics and the perception that in the sort of the conservative side of politics marries traditional Buddhism, the Sangha and all that with conservative politics, that this younger generation that you mentioned who have with the, you know, the, um, the, dismantling of the future forward party that so many of them were enthusiastic uh, supporters of in 2019, that they also then reject sort of the religious aspect of, of conservatism in Thailand. That's an hypothesis at least. Um, so that might also explain some of this, why they don't give alms to monks, but they why sing succeed, right? They, no, that's so that might be an, that's a hypothesis. Paul. I'm trying to monopolize. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I just have one comment and one question. And uh, I guess the comment is when we look at the anomaly of Pak Pachachat, you know, Pak Pachachat is very much a religious party, which comes out of Wada originally, Wada group, Muslim, religious, and yet it's in the opposition. So it seems to sort of be the anomaly that doesn't, you know, correspond to those parties that are religious and supporting Prayut. That was my only, that's a comment. And the question, is um, how do you account for temporality? Like, you know, different idiot, the ideology of a party can change over time, or the perceptions of people can change. And so, for example, WADA was originally two factions 
of Dan Tomina and Wanna Muhammad. And then in 2000, in 2004, Wada was in Tyrak Thai. The Kruasai massacre, Takbai massacres happened. It made the Wada look like it was on the side of the military. Then there was a split. And now Dan Tomina's faction is part of Bumjai Thai. For, for, I would, perhaps for factional reasons. Uh, so that's why I'm bringing up the idea of temporality. So well, That's a very good, good uh, idea to bring up temporality. And what I offered here is a snapshot in time. Uh, you know, 2019, this is the picture that emerges. Uh, you know, someone else <laughs> might, you know, have an idea to go and look at how has this changed over time. And there are some some things that I notice, right, that uh, that, the, you know, I compared some of the, you know, earlier, earlier. I mentioned, I think, the Democrat Party's platforms that there was a change. There was also a chain in the change in the Puatai platform of 2008. There was no mention of Buddhism, but in 2019 they mentioned Buddhism, right? So they they change their positioning. Um, with regards to the uh, to to Prashashat and this sort of uh, anomaly, one of the things that I think facilitated the emergence of that party as a religious party in a way, right, closely tied to Islam, although not championing a kind of Islamic nationalism, but multiculturalism, includes support of all religions, which is sort of, you know, compatible with cosmopolitan royalism. It doesn't go against that, even if it doesn't quite articulate its position in those terms necessarily. But what made that possible, I think, both for Puatai and Prashashat, was the new electoral system in 2019, which favored smaller parties, which meant that the old Wada faction could break away. And rather than seeking inclusion in a big umbrella party, could move out and form a separate party, which meant that both those parties, sort of the Puatai and Prashashat, could take more clear positions on religion if they try to live together in one party, it's more difficult for them to do that, I think, right? So the fact that they split out essentially the m Muslim faction of Puatai meant that the, re the remaining Puatai could take a more sort of Buddhist position. And because the, you know, their allies in the South had the Muslim side covered and they didn't need to win those votes. So that might, at least um, explain some of those dynamics. But there's something that someone would have to look at <laughs> and, and, and study and understand. And, and, and that's also one of the reasons why we don't know whether or not we will find these patterns and these things in the forthcoming national elections because the, the rules, the electoral rules are changing, right? So it's less friendly towards small parties. So it might then mean that parties will have to try to include all different kinds of groups under one roof, uh, which might make clear sort of positions uh, in, in religious nationalist terms, at least, more problematic. Um, but that remains to be seen. So it might be that 2019 in part is the effect of the electoral system, um, creating a space for these political parties. And, and with the new electoral system, maybe some of that doesn't go away, but shrinks. Did you want to ask him? Yeah, thank you very much, um, Dr. Um, Thomas. Um, it's such a great uh, presentation and very, you know, eye-opening um, information and really give the impetus on the, the variable of religion that affects the voting behavior. And um, so I just have um, perhaps like, questions slash comment. Um, I think um, I share the, um, the, the same opinion as Paul, that uh, with regard to the Muslim, right, um, voters and uh, the belief and, you know, um, for your survey. So I'm just wondering um, what kind of 
you know, the the group that you're, you know, doing a survey, like the region in Bangkok or the deep south Muslim or, you know, like is is it all over Thailand or mostly in Bangkok? Because I I think if it is in Bangkok, there would be a high chance, of course, you know, that that the Muslim community in Bangkok would pro, you know, a military because they they actually they have been closely related to, you know, the the royal family as well historically, right? Like Ban Krua in Bangkok. And 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 so if you add region, right? The the south and the deep south, you know, versus like the Bangkok and et cetera, you might have a different kind of a pictures. I, I'm not sure. And um and the um the second um question that I have is about the a class analysis within um, Buddhism, right? So um, we have a different kind of a sex and also like, you know, some, you know, a middle class go to a certain type of temples and, you know, adhere to uh, a certain belief of Buddhism as opposed to, you know, um, other, um, you know, uh, a class thing. And so um, I I'm wondering if you add this class a variable into your analysis that would bring a different kind of a beliefs and behavior that affects the voting behavior of you know the the group that you are analyzing and and the, and the last how would you explain the use of religion as you know political party just want to win you know the election how would you explain the use of religion by political party as merely electoral instrument? It comes and go. They they would ad adhere to any kind of uh, 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 idea or or issue that really help them with the votes. Thank you very much. So the uh, the national survey. Um, is um, designed to be a nationally representative survey. So it does include voters from different parts of the country. So that's sort of already factored in there. Um, but I mean, 1500 is, is you know, it's, a, it's not a huge survey, right? If we did, you know, 200,000, we would probably get a, a much finer detailed understanding of of voting patterns in the different regions. As it stands, it's difficult for us to sort of break out and look at sort of, well, what are the voting patterns just in the South? Because the numbers become so small then that we can't really analyze that, unfortunately. But if one, if someone has a lot of money and would like to know the answers to these questions, you know, I, I know someone who, who would like to do a survey on that, right? So, yeah. Um, on on class, yes, um, we had the variable education, which my education level, and also well, so so that might capture some of that, uh, and we also had urban, which might capture some of that. So in the control variables, we have sort of a little bit of that, but it's far from perfect. Um, in you know how to operationalize in a sense the class variable. We don't have data on income or anything like that that we could control for, um, unfortunately. Uh, there was a third question. What was that? Remind me. Uh, yes, so it, that this is, uh, yes, I, I, I mean, I, I don't disagree with the idea that that, uh, that politicians are strategic in, in their deployment of, of, uh, of, of rhetoric and discourse that echoes or not uh, religious elements. So, yeah, that's uh, probably correct that it is uh, following a certain, you know, uh, tendency in politics. They think that they might be able to gain some votes on this and they try it out. And some people are actually not successful, right? So the one of the striking things is that those Tamatipatai parties got so few votes, right? 
they were not successful in selling that. They were successful in pushing for the inclusion of Tamatipatai in the 20 year national plan. So if you didn't know it, your the ties here, your country is supposed to be Tamatipatai in 20 years, even though no one actually voted for the Tamatipatai parties. <laughs> Or very few people did, at least, right? <laughs> and and Haibuniti uh, party, of course, was uh, discontinued, dissolved, and he became deputy leader of Palang Pasharat. So he moved, and that party is no more. And he will presumably contest the next election under the Palang Pasharat banner or some other party banners. Everything seems to be in flux, as far as that is concerned. Hello. So uh, I, the, 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 the question is, is there a relation among religion, racism and the leader they choose? And my answer is, I don't know. I'm not sure how to operationalize racism either. Thank you for this statistic. It's wonderful. Should I argue in Thai or in English? Okay, in Thai is clearly. So, โดยปกติแล้วค่ะหนูมีความเชื่อว่าศาสนากับการเมืองเนี่ยมันแยกจากกันไม่ได้อยู่แล้วซึ่งหลายๆประเทศก็เป็นอย่างเช่นญี่
Um, so, yeah, <laughs> you, can, you will have to be creative and innovative. Mm. Thank you for indeed for me to, to ask a question for you. And first, I will say the comment first because I've had a lot of comment on this this session and your topic because in it seems that from the two topic the some survey data analysis and see that it's very confusing and chaotic because it has a, some some indicator that I see that it's very news or maybe some base so basic and some basic is is not in truth just like a age of people or maybe occupation because uh, in the 2019 uh, they have uh, some popular list allow for future for the in the youth people and it's a it's a say political opinion is changing dramatically and some and COVID-19 you say that in right now it's a very distinct people because the youth people is not ready to go to temple in the Buddhist because we, we, yes we are uh, believe in Buddhist and thing, but we do not do, do it everything about chanting or maybe Takbat in a food yeah uh, and my comment I'm not my comment is uh, the information between chai between people between adult or other people older people and you people are they separate in a group of life or maybe some information that's only exclusive between the group of people just like other people, they may share some information that is a conspiracy theory in this Buddhism, or maybe some thing that they say that these two people are some, the Satan they they told on the ear as a to spreading this conspiracy on the on them. But but it seems like they have a conflict between themselves or maybe between the youth that something we can see on the TV that some people who are walk in the in the street that they are mass about this youth are, are try to to disturb our our country and nation and disrupt uh, the religions of our Buddhism and the uh, king institution. And it's my question. Mm, yeah, uh, it's an, a lot of opinion for me because I see the flaw something this is very is very some kind is a yeah. Yeah. And then my okay. Then then to my question for now. My question is: Do you think that is this religion only the only the indicator that is very relevant to this Thai political party to be a uh, voting for for people who are interesting in how to change country or maybe preserve their culture norm? เอ่อขอพูดภาษาไทยครับผมกลัวพูดแล้วมันจําเหมือนก็คือคําถามของผมคือว่าในการเมืองของไทยเนี่ยเรื่องศาสนาพุทธหรือศาสนาต่างๆ
those questions. So more research will have to go into this. And in our statistical analysis, we find that many of the control variables like age, uh, region, etc., they are also statistically significant. So they also help predict how people vote with older voters going for Palang Prasharata and their allies, right? And younger people tending to be more uh, more supportive of, of the other side of politics. So it's a combination of factors that come together to, to shape um, vote choices. So I just wanted to get that nuance in there. ตรงนี้มีบ้างมั้ยตรงนี้มีบ้างมั้ยอ่ามุมเนี้ยมีนั่งเงียบอยู่ทําไมอ่ะทําไมอ่ะอ่าได้ได้ชัดเจนมากใ
and everything can't be a religion, right? So you have to draw these boundaries around certain things, certain practices, certain ideas that are protected because they are religious, right? So there's always a political element in, in the relationship between um, religion and politics. So even the most sort of secular state actually has to define what's religion um, in, 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 in a, yeah. It's, so it's kind of, it's unavoidable that there's some relationship between the state and religion. Um, furthermore, even in states where you might say that the ideological or institutional links between the state and religion are weak or non-existent, to the extent that people still have religious identities and beliefs, they might, their, their political choices, uh, their preferences in politics might be shaped by those commitments, which means that you can't necessarily take religion out of politics altogether, unless you're somehow able to take religion out of people, right? Um, and again, this then does raise the question of what exactly is a religion, and it's not a straightforward thing, actually. We are using a kind of a conventional common sense understanding of what religion is here. You know, it's Buddhism, it's Islam, it's Christianity, and so on and so forth. Uh, but in the sociological tradition, there are people who say that, well, actually, religion concerns sacred things. Things like sit, clap my clap. And what's sacred? And and the Durkheim who advanced this position says that all societies have something that they treat as sacred. That's what makes them a society. Right. So we can think of then secular nationalism as a kind of religion or in a Durkheimian sense, a, uh, a religion that holds certain things for sacred things that you're almost not allowed to question. Right. And, um, and nationalism might be one of those things that have become sacred. No? And, and in, in the modern West, you might say that the individual has become sacred. We believe in human rights. And the individual is kind of, has a sacred kind of status. Is that religion? Well, not in the conventional sort of understanding, but some sociologists would argue that, you know, it's kind of you know, similar, functionally similar. And perhaps democracy is a religion. Perhaps Marxism and socialism are religions, political religions. They have holy texts written by Karl Marx and others, just like the Bible or the Quran. Different texts, different prophets, but structurally similar. Promising a future that is bright, where all the evils of the world have disappeared, and we live in righteousness. Is that religion? Well, not in a conventional sense. <laughs> so that complicates. Man sapsan, sapsan mag. Of that the participants they focus on the interest that they uh, gain from the leaders of the religious I cannot see it. Out of poor top, bab, soft ham, cow focus, tea pot, and pray your tea at Jadai Rapjak, poor num, tea nap to Satsana, dear can rumai. ประชาชนมีความกังวลเกี่ยวกับการแบ่งแยกศาสนาเกิดขึ้นหรือเปล่า
Well, yeah, well, okay. So this, so it's a question about what the respondents to the survey think uh, uh, about whether there is some benefit or interest uh, to vote for uh, people who hold the same religion. Uh, and, and also that citizens, voters, might be worried about uh, religious divisions in society. Um, we have seen in a neighboring country, Burma, very stark examples of communal violence, right? And in southern Thailand, for many years now, we have seen evidence of communal conflict, tension, and so on. Sri Lanka recently, similarly, right? So religion is a kind of potentially explosive political issue. So it's certainly the case that voters might be worried about divisions within society, bang yak, right? And that's one of the things that supports that that is a common worry, I think, is the results we found when we asked about what's important for being a true Thai. Thai Thai, you have to be a true Thai. Some of you have to say that it's important. Right? People are not, don't think that, right? So it shows that they're kind of concerned about ensuring that Thai-ness does incorporate um, space for non-Buddhist uh, peoples, some space, but of course it's, you know, it's kind of conflict, <laughs> it's conditional, it's difficult, but, but at the level of an ideological commitment, I think it's there. Um, what was the, the, the first question here is about, um, about the, you know, supporting, um, members of the same religion or sort of voting for people of the same religion. And I don't think that we in our data have any kind of um, any any way of testing that. We would need to have, I could imagine like an experiment, like in a, in a certain constituency where there are say both, or well, there are Muslims, Christians, uh, Buddhists, Hindus and Sikhs, and you have political candidates who, who identify differently along these lines, right? And then you can survey voters there, and you might be able to pick up whether or not Buddhists prefer to vote for the Buddhist candidates rather than for the Muslim or Christian candidates and, and vice versa, right? So with our survey da data, we, we can't get at that question. It's an excellent question, but I don't know what the answer is. Uh, but enterprising dissertation writers. Do you write dissertations here, maybe? Do little research projects? Well, that's a research project for you. The election is coming up. Go and do the research. Find out what the answer to that question might be. Yeah? Uh, Hello, I am Mantita. I am Bachelor degree of International Business Management. Yeah. So me as a new generation, religion is become a meme, a funny meme, joke meme, and viral. Yeah, you understand? Uh, <laughs> so uh, what is the trend of religion in the future if uh, people make fun with it. Yeah. Yeah, this is the question. Yeah. <laughs> um uh civilization <laughs> of um equality of human are equal more than more than now. Um, bro, of the region, some some part, 
some part of religion. Yes. I just want to ask your opinion. What if, like, uh, if you in the government party or in political party? So, uh, you yes, I I just add the opinions. So, if what if like, uh, that they use the religion to attract the people in the, the, the use with the policy. So, what if that that uh some rule and regulation in the religion they uh, have conflicts or uh, it's like uh, unethical so what should we do you do like because i just argue opinion what what if it was you and it this scenario happen uh เหมือนแบบว่าเราใช้ศาสนาในการดึงดูดคนในการจะเข้ามากับเอ่อนโยบายต่างๆของพรรคการเมืองแล้วทีนี้ถ้าสมมุติเอ่อเอ่อตัว
Um, I mentioned, I think, earlier that one of the reasons I think that some of these religious nationalist, Buddhist, militantly Buddhist parties emerged was related to changes in the electoral system, right, which favored small parties which created kind of an opportunity for these rather small movements to suddenly gain a, you know, oh, we can enter politics now. And that was because the electoral rules were favoring small parties. Um, you, you can then think about ways of designing electoral systems to essentially create an incentive structure for politicians to appeal to voters belonging to very different religious and other communities, right? They have to form coalitions because the rules force them to, right? And it might be that the changes in the electoral rules for the next election has some of that effect. Some of these very small, more religious nationalist parties will find it difficult um, and they will have to be incorporated uh, or don't have to, but they're likely to kind of get uh, incorporated into larger parties that have to appeal to a wider audience. They can't be so narrow. They have to appeal to everyone. So there's an element of institutional design that might facilitate some of this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kav. Thank you. Uh, because, because the focus is about religion and election, one thing that share between these two words is belief, um, the good thing and the bad things, right? But I wonder if the people who have no religion, like for uh, because this this is quite obvious that uh, this is the phenomenon around the world. The increasing number of people who have no religion is increasing every year. So what are the beliefs of this group about the good thing and the bad things, you know, without the basics of religion to support them? And how do they choose the political party without, you know, this basic knowledge or the belief about the goodness and the badness? That would be, a, it, it, it could be the missing point that you, if we have this kind of information, maybe we can narrow down the gap between uh, the religion and um, the election. That's a very good question. And uh, I mean, in Thailand, the, the proportion of people who say that they have no religion is tiny, right? And it partly reflects a belief, and which I think that you're echoing in articulating that question, which is that religion is the basis of morality and without religion there is no morality right so so the prospect of a society where there is no religion is kind of terrifying right yeah from that perspective um so even people who actually don't necessarily hold very strong beliefs if we ask them you know what religion are you and do you believe in a religion and so on and so forth we'll be inclined to say yes i do but some of the research, you know, the respondents here, when we, we know sort of anecdotally, when the, the survey people who go out asking these questions and ask them, what religion uh, do you belong to? They will ask back, do you mean by my Bat Pasha Shon and my Tabian Ban? Or, right? So, so you have a kind of a formal id right it's on your id card or your your house registration that you are a shall put um so so that doesn't necessarily tell us anything about any belief right you can believe whatever you want but it happens to say buddhist on your id card right um so 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 that is you know so it's difficult to get at that the sort of non-religious non-believer in thailand which is why we're finding, or one of the reasons perhaps why we're finding so few of them in the in the surveys. Although I think if we look over time, it's probably increasing over time. Um, but otherwise, I do think that it's certainly possible for people who do not have any strong religious commitments and don't believe in heaven and hell and similar things, right, to nevertheless 
believe that certain things are good and other things are bad. So you don't, in, 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 and, and some of that might be sort of based on religion that has been lost in the sense that uh, a lot of our moral systems and, and so on were developed within a religious framework over the past few thousands of years, right? Um, but certain societies on earth have become extremely secularized. Um, Sweden, my home country, being one of them. Um, but most Swedes certainly think that they know the difference between good and bad, right and wrong. Right, and Sweden is even positioning itself on the world stage, or it used to at least, as a moral superpower. <laughs> right, uh, but not based on a, you know, a religious crusade or anything like that. Um, but rather for secular, we might call it a secular religious values, democracy, human rights, etc., etc. You have been very patient, thank you. So I have three comments. First, first, tightness. In the 1930s, in the 1930s, there appeared the anti-Chinese feelings uh, and uh, anti-Chinese policies was implemented by the people government with the assistance of the ideologue uh, Richard Watagan, Juan Richard Watagan. At that time, uh, Tainess, it was uh, also emphasized. Speaking Thai language first, the same as you showed, language. Second, political loyalty, political loyalty to the monarch or the government. Third, don't send money to China, to the money. So they don't uh, talk about the blood or lineage. Ethnicity, nothing. So I think, so you said the religious, they are not uh, mentioned. Religious is not mentioned for tightness. Tightness, religious is not, religion is not important. Tightness, time must not be Buddhist. Uh, any, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, not say, not say yeah. It's like this, like this. They don't talk about the lineage, ethnicity. So I think it's a very similar ethnicity, or even they don't uh, care about ethnicity. Why they, why Thai government or Thai people uh, care about the religion? It's fast, my comment. So, so even though, yeah. e, even though they don't care about that blood yeah. or ethnicity, why they would care about religion? I think ethnicity or blood is more important than religion, but they don't talk about the ethnicity. They from China, not important. Thai language, loyal, political loyalty, economic loyalty, were important. Other, yeah. So, second, so the yeah, Muslim uh, pro government, military junta government. Yes, I think so. But uh, already the Achan Napisa and Achan Paul uh, mentioned my Muslim in Bangkok or Muslim here are minority. But the uh, Muslim in the deep south are majority. So their attitude, or political attitude are different. But uh, the data show the in general. So most of them pro-government. Here in Pisan Rock, I was taken by my friend to mosque. They are very conservative. They are pro-government because they are minority here. But in the deep south, it's different. And it is not, I don't think it relates to the religion. It's, I, we can say everything about minority. Minority must protect themselves by themselves. 
so they have to go to pro government to protect themselves. Like me, I belong to the Buddhist group in Japan and here in Thailand. So they are very conservative. They show the picture of the king and the queen because they have to protect foreign religious group from Thai government or oppression. So the minority uh, unite to protect themselves. Religious group, political group, or the ethnicity group. So we could say everything. Uh, yeah, and uh, sad, sad. More older, more conservative. More conservative, more pious, more religious. So I think uh, your uh, your uh, argument has a uh, a little bit. Yeah, yeah I, I I'm very interested in your topics and your uh, research are very fascinating. But uh, I'm afraid your research have a very small risky risky or a weak point that is uh, for me similar that the K pops. K-pops helped the youth movement. K-pops influenced the youth movement. Well, I don't know this argument. Why this argument come from? K-pops helped uh, the youth movement. Because most of the participants in the youth movement, they love K-pops. So K-pops helped youth movement. K-pops are the causal, 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 uh, causality, and uh, cause effect is a uh, uprising of the youth. So if we put this theory to your this topic, religious affect the political choice, something. Yeah, I, I understand Polit uh, religious issue is very important in the political circle or political issues. Yes, I know. But uh, it has a risk. Religious groups determined the politics, like the K-pop. I think uh, the generation issue is uh, more important rather than the religion. I think uh, no political group uh, deny religion or exclude the other religious groups. Uh, but some, yeah, some have... Uh, 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 uh. Thank you. We, we, I mean, your question about the link between ethnicity and uh, and religion is a good one. And I mean, we um, we can't in this data tease out the relationship between sort of sub ethnicities at least and. Um, and 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 tiness. I mean, one could imagine that you would have questions about uh, Bampaburut, your ancestors, right? And there, uh, where where they come from, if they're from China or from Java or where they might come from, right? And uh, and so on. So there's there's possibility at least for people to sort of do research that does actually tease out the difference between. Uh, between religion and this ethnicity, and some people have done that in in studies of an Indonesian gubernatorial election in Jakarta a few years ago now. And if you recall, there was a uh, a candidate who was accused of who was ethnic Chinese and who was accused of um, and actually charged and convicted for blasphemy or some sort of insult to Islam, right? And this led to mobilization uh, of, of, of opposition against him. And the 
some enterprising scholars have used surveys and data from those that time to try to tease out whether this was anti-Chinese or sort of driven by Islam. So there is potential for trying to tease these things out empirically, but I don't think we can do that quite here. As for the importance or not of, uh, of, of these phenomena, I think that uh, in relation to the literature, it's potentially um, a bit important, at least in signaling that something that, despite you say that you know it, actually the literature on elections at least says that it's not important. So in that sense, it's quite new, I think. Um, and it, I clearly don't think, as I said it, that I don't think that it's the most important factor necessarily. I'm sorry, I know everyone wants to eat lunch, but I have one final question. <laughs> Come, Tom, go up. Uh, okay, the, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, okay. Religion and state, uh, you know, trying to, you know, keep them separate. Um, there is a man named Gon Midi, yes. and he has a Buddhist association that wants Ah, yeah, right. Uh -huh. He wanted to make Buddhism the state religion. And, uh, you know, when they were writing their 2017 constitution, and then also the 2007 constitution. And if, I mean, it did not become the state religion, but someone asked him, what would it mean if Buddhism became the state religion? And he said, well, it'll be like 112. If people are going to talk bad about Buddhism, well, we can we can punish them. And so my question is, did you I wonder if you've asked the perceptions about the perceptions of Thai people making Buddhism the state religion? Or what anything you found out about that? That so that's one of those questions that I think in a longer survey one would ask. You know, I'd be interested in asking these types of questions about the connection between morality and religion, about the connection between uh, the constitutional status of, of Buddhism and, uh, and so on. So, so essentially, if you have other suggestions for things that we should ask that might allow us to sort of tease out what it is that people actually kind of believe uh, in, 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 in not about religion, but about politics, and about the relationship between morality, religion, and politics, and the state. Uh, you know, I'm all ears. Please come with suggestions like that. I'd love to to hear them. Yeah, but you and uh, you and you said that they it didn't become the state religion. But if you look at the 2017 constitution, it's the first constitution ever to mention Theravada Buddhism. So they got 50 percent of what they wanted, not quite everything. Um, so there was an addition of a, of a section of the constitution that commits the Thai state to the promotion and protection of Theravada Buddhism. Mm, so yeah, they, they, they won 50% of that war, I think. อ่าขอบคุณครับอันนี้ขอพูดภาษาไทยนะครับอันนี้คืออาจจะเป็นเรื่องที่ผมเห็นแล้วบอกว่าเอ้ยเขามาจะไปเข้าร่วมงานและในงานนั้นมันจะมีการประกาศชื่อหรือทีนี้มันจะมีเรื่องที่ผมคิดว่ามันอาจจะเป็น
บุคคลมีชื่อเสียงหรือคนที่มีอิทธิพลเนี่ยเขาใช้ตัวนี้ในการเชื่อมให้คนเนี่ยที่เคร่งศาสนาอยู่แล้วเข้าหาเขาได้ง่ายขึ้นจากการที่ว่าใช้พิธีกรรมในการพบปะของผู้คนต่างๆเนี่ยมารวมเป็นศูนย์รวมในการขยายอํานาจทางความคิดของเขาครับ No I think that's A good observation. It's absolutely true. One of the things I might mention also along these lines of, uh, you know, of, of of essentially countering the influence of religion in politics. I don't know, but there, if you if you recall this, but there was a one MP. I think it was from Chiang Mai, Chiang Mai, who was struck off for an electoral offence. And what he had done during the electoral period was to make a donation to a monk, to a temple. He'd given them a clock, I think, or something like that, worth two thousand baht, and that was an electoral offense. So, so the electoral rules have been written to try to separate, at least, Buddhism and uh, and and the temples from from the electoral process. So from การเมืองการหาเสียง entering the temple so this is sort of an uh, you know an aspect of that essentially trying to make that more difficult um, to use religion uh, in 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 a rather I think rather odd way but nevertheless <laughs> that's uh, all right I think that's all is it lunchtime thank you very much for your patience and your questions and comments I've learned a lot thank you.